Okay, well, it's uh, 731, and I think we'll we'll go ahead and begin. Again, my name is David Martin. I'm the Executive Director at the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery, and I'm joined tonight by uh, Michael Bednar, Associate Executive Director at the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery, uh, David Elstein, who's our Manager in Communications, and Sonia Parker, who is uh, one of our certification specialists and handles all the Part 1 application process. And what we'll go over tonight is the Part 1 examination application, what you need to know before applying for the Part 1 ABOS board certification examination. Uh, I will go to the next slide. Here we go. So I'd just like to start by covering the ABOS mission statement. Our mission is to ensure the safe, ethical, and effective practice of orthopedic surgery. We do that by maintaining the highest standards for education, for practice, and for conduct. And we do that with examination, certification, and maintenance of certification programs. And we exist for the benefit of the public and for our profession. I'd also like to cover one of our guiding principles and something that has uh, uh, affected all of our programs. We believe that there is no place for bias or discrimination within the field of orthopedic surgery or within our organization. And we are taking steps in all of our programs and pro processes to be sure that there is no place uh, for bias there. I'd like to introduce you to our board of directors, uh, and I show this uh, picture to you for several reasons. This is a dedicated group of practicing orthopedic surgeons who look at all of the programs and processes of the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery and do their best to get those programs right. This is a dedicated group of practicing orthopedic surgeons. I show you this to let you know that they are not out to make things more difficult, but rather out to form programs that are beneficial to our profession that are for orthopedic surgeons by orthopedic surgeons. And I'd encourage you to contact any one of these individuals to talk about any part of the ABOS uh, certification process, and they'd be happy to discuss that with you. I also show you this picture to let you know that these are practicing orthopedic surgeons. They all go through the same processes that we do uh, to become board certified. You see initial board certification dates and also recertification dates. And several of our board of directors are subspecialty certified in either surgery of the hand or orthopedic sports medicine. We also do have a public member of our board. So just an overview of our webinar tonight. We'll try and cover board certification requirements, what the requirements are to start the process to become board certified, what the nuts and bolts are of the application for the part one examination. And then at the end, we'll try and answer your questions. And the way we'll do that is we'll have you raise your hand in Zoom and then we'll call on you, we'll unmute you and we'll attempt to answer your question. So the ABOS Part 1 examination application requires four elements. Number one is meeting the requirements. Number two is completing and submitting the ABOS Part 1 examination application. Number three is paying the examination fee at the time of the application submission. And number four, finally, is obtaining a signature from your residency program director that certifi certifies you as ready to take the examination. That signature is actually done through the ABOS office once you accomplish the first three of those. With regards to the application and fee submission, all of the required documents and the application fee are submitted through your ABOS dashboard. And that's done by going to www.abos.org. You should have a username and password. If you don't know that, you can click the forgot username or forgot password password buttons to access those, and you'll then receive an email to the addresses that we have in the ABOS database. You can enter two email addresses into our database. Please be sure that one of those is your personal email address. As you leave your institution, and keep in mind that you will apply while you are at your current academic institution. However, you will be gone from that institution by the time you take the examination in July of 2024. And therefore, we need a personal email address to communicate with you, and we need that throughout your career. I'd encourage you to keep your email address with the ABOS up to date, because that's what we use as our primary source of communication. So what are the requirements? You need to be in the fifth year of an ACGME accredited orthopedic residency program, 
or have already completed an ACGME accredited orthopedic residency program at the time of the application. The final 24 months of your orthopedic residency must be obtained from a single ACGME accredited orthopedic residency program. So yes, you can move from one program to another in the first three years, but the last two years has to be at one program. Those have to be continuous. The residency requirements are found in our ABS rules and procedures. Those are on our website. Canadian residents, you have to have program approval by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada of the program that you have completed, and you must pass the certification examination of the Royal College before applying for the ABOS Part 1 examination. If you've done a residency program outside of the United States or Canada, then you would go through the ABOS academic pathway. That is also in the ABOS rules and procedures. I'd encourage you to look at that or contact our offices and we'll be happy to walk you through that. So what about the application? The application requests general information that's routinely seen on applications that you filled out many times, applications of this type. There are a few notes that I would uh, uh, direct you to that'll make it easier to fill out the application. You are gonna need the names and dates attended of your undergraduate school, your graduate school, if applicable, your medical school, your residency program. You'll need the name and email address of your program director and any state medical licenses that you have, you'll need to have those numbers. So it's a good idea to have those things in hand prior to starting to fill out the application. As far as the costs and expenses, the examination fee is $1,040. That's paid at the time that you submit the application. This is new this year, we've moved that date up. That date is October 1st, 2023. The application is open now, so you can go ahead and start on that but it's due October 1st, 2023, 4 p.m. Eastern time. If you need an additional two weeks, you can take that, but there's, an, there's a $500 late fee. That's an additional fee. Uh, and that it's just one examination fee and that allows you to sit for the examination, but it has to be in by October 1st. We've moved that earlier. It used to be in December around the time of the holidays. This was very hard to contact people and to make sure everyone got their applications in over the holidays. And so we've moved that earlier. So to summarize the process, you finalize the application and pay the examination fee by October 1st, 2023. That's October 1st of this year to take the exam in July of 2024. We will email your an attestation to your program director and they will sign that. Our credentials committee will then meet in early 2024, generally in April, and go over all of those applications. In May of 2024, you should receive an email asking you to log into your ABOS dashboard and you'll schedule your examination through that process. I would encourage you, once you get that email that tells you to go to your dashboard and there'll be directions as to how to schedule the examination, try and schedule your examination as soon as possible. That will give you the best chance of scheduling at the Pearson Professional Center that's closest and most convenient to you. Those are located across the country. You may have heard from your colleagues that they have tested at Prometric Testing Centers. If you've been through the uh, uh, NBMA, US, NBME USMLE test, those have been at Prometric Testing Centers. The ABOS has moved our examinations to Pearson Professional Centers. Uh, we have actually started that uh, with our recertification exams this month, and it's gone very well. So I encourage you, again, get to your website and schedule that soon so you can get to the center of your choice. You'll take the examination on July 11th, 2024. In late August of 2024, you'll receive an email asking you to, again, log into your ABS dashboard, and that's where your examination results will be delivered. Again, uh, I said this before, I'll say it again, please keep the ABS updated throughout your career with your current contact information. The email is critical. We take great pains when we email an individual. If you get an email from the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery, it is meant specifically for you. We do not send out blanket emails to the entire country saying all orthopedic surgeons, if you want to take the part one examination, you should apply. When we send out an email, it goes specifically to people who are supposed to get that email. So please keep your email up to date. As far as preparing for the examination, 
Uh, this is important. We have uh, spent a great deal of time putting together a blueprint for the examination. This is on our website. You can, it's a PDF file, so you can click on it and download it. It's 18 to 20 pages. Uh, you can see the first page of it there. And that has you know five sections, general principles, adult spine, upper extremity, lower extremity, pediatrics. And it has the percentages of questions uh, in each of those areas. If you multiply the percentages uh, by 328, you'll understand, you'll get the number of how many of those questions will be on the examination. If you click on any one of those headings, that will take you to additional pages that give you more detail. Uh, also on our website is a block timing. I'll talk about that. There's a tutorial that takes you through the platform that the test is given on. And I'd encourage you to go to our website, do that tutorial before you get to the examination site. Familiarize yourself with how to underline, how to look at the questions, how to look at the images. That's very important, especially if you've been used to the USMLE process, because we are now Pearson View Centers and the platform is slightly different. All of that information is found on our website under candidates. And if you click on part one, you'll find that. This is the block timing for the examination. There are seven blocks. Six of those blocks have 52 examination items and 75 minutes to finish that block. The last block has 16 items and you have 30 minutes in that block. So it's a total number of items of 328 in seven blocks. That's uh, 40 minutes of break time and 20 minutes of tutorial time. That adds up to nine hours of testing. Once you leave one block, you can't go back to that block. So you'll do one block, 52 questions. Once you finish that block and you click end, you can enter a break time, but you can't go back to that block. If you try and take a break in the middle of a block, that's an unauthorized break. And so you want to try and plan your breaks so you can do one block, then you can take a break if you need it. Then you go on to the next block, complete that block, and take a break. You have 40 minutes of break time. The tutorial time is 20 minutes. If you do the tutorial before you get there, you can then breeze through the tutorial then, and you'll have 60 minutes of break time. And that's time to go to the bathroom, to get a snack if you need it, those sorts of things. This is also on our website uh, if you need access to that. As far as accommodations, Anyone who needs accommodations per the American Disabilities Act, you need to complete that form. It's found on our website and you submit that at the time of the application. That's if you need extra time, if you need a private room, uh, those types of things. If you will be a breastfeeding mother at the time of the examination and need to pump, you may need additional break time. And there's also a candidate form for that that you can fill out on our website and we can then get you additional break time. That does split the test up over two days, unfortunately, because these testing centers are not open for more than nine hours, um, but you can get additional break time in that way. Any accommodations that you need in that way, please contact our office so that we can set that up. The breastfeeding is also something that we need to set up. The testing centers are slightly different and you wanna check out the testing center to make sure they have the appropriate room or access to whatever you need uh, to do that. And so please make those requests at the time of the application that will make the process much easier. We do have a linking study with the OITE that you may know about. We're now in year four of that process. So we have worked with the Academy to collaborate on a group of items that appear on the part one examination in July. And then those questions are transferred to the academy and they appear on the OIT examination in October. That allows us to roughly link the examinations so that you can look at your OIT score and see if that roughly corresponds to a passing score on the part one examination. The fine print here is, you know, objects in the mirror closer than they appear. Uh, it's a rough linking. If we were gonna link the examinations exactly, it would be the exact same questions on both examinations. We can't do that, but we've tried to roughly link those to make the OIT more valuable so you can use it as a standard to see where you are in acquiring that orthopedic knowledge base. Obviously, there's no guarantee. So if you attain a reasonable score in the OIT, that just means you ought to keep studying and then you'll do fine on the part one examination.
Another thing I'd like to point out to you, and this comes from our uh, ABOS resident advisory panel, uh, they have helped us and said, you know, we don't have a roadmap. We don't know what we're supposed to be doing at any point in our residency or our career. And if you go to absroadmap.org, this is the front page of that website. And so there's three areas that you can click on any one of these gray boxes. So while you're in residency, if you click there, it'll show you what things you ought to think about in PGY 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If you click on the middle box, it'll take you through part one and part two to get to be initially board certified. If you click on the third box, maintenance of certification, that takes you through the rest of your career. And you can really click on any of those stages. There are a number of very valuable links there. So I'd encourage you to look at that. And if you have questions throughout your career, uh, you can go back to that site, absroadmap.org. Uh, these are our certification specialists throughout your career. Uh, once Sonia gets you through uh, residency in part one, uh, you'll be assigned to a certification specialist. And uh, they are assigned based on uh, the first letter of your last name. And they're listed here, but uh, uh, feel free to call or email these people anytime we answer the phone and we are anxious to answer your questions. Uh, one of the urban legends is that if you do call the ABOS, we write down your name. Uh, that's not true. Feel free to call us with questions. We're happy to try and guide you through this process. Don't be like the Tyrannosaurus Rex, okay? We send out numerous, numerous, numerous communications about programs and deadlines and when someone's about to miss a deadline. If you keep your email up to date, you will receive multiple emails about a deadline. I cannot tell you how many people call me and say, wow, I must have just missed the email and I didn't get that in on time. And I say, no, actually you missed seven emails and didn't get that in on time. So please try and keep your email up to date. And if you see an email from the ABOS, please look at it. Uh, just a couple other um, things to mention. Our, our website has a lot of information, absroadmap.org. We just talked about, we are active on all these areas of social media. So feel free to follow us there. I uh, just lost it. There we go. Uh, and this is our podcast uh, hosted by David Elstein, who you see here with us tonight. Uh, it's at anchor FM forward slash ABOS or wherever you get your podcasts. I would encourage you to look at this. We have podcasts there about how we write the examinations, how we put the examinations together, how we set the passing standards, uh, interviews with orthopedic leaders that talk about their careers and why they got into orthopedic surgery and how they progressed through their careers. Uh, interviews with people who've been successful in each part of our board certification process. So I'd encourage you to go and check that out. There's a lot of valuable information there. Uh, that's all the formal information I have. I really thank you for your attention. Uh, this is my contact information there. And uh, we'll be happy now to answer any questions. I will uh, stop screen sharing. And if you will raise your hand in the Zoom, we'll try and... Uh, turn on your sound and answer your questions. Wow. I can't imagine there's no questions. You did a perfect job, Dr. Martin. Uh, this would be a first. Uh, uh, I, I would ask uh, Sonia or David Elstein if there's anything that uh, I missed out on or, or didn't cover uh, in enough detail. No, that I can think of, no. Uh, I see a couple of Just email. Uh, are you going to try it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would again, I, I know it sounds like we're beating a dead horse, but Sonia will tell you how many phone calls we get from people who say, well, I never got that email. And we said, well, we sent it to, in the case of Wake Forest, we sent it to wakehealth.edu. And then the, the candidate says, well, they shut that down on July 1. And that's why we said, well, that's why we tried to remind you to put in an email that will update. David, are you going to call yep. on? So Dr. let's take a question for Dr. Santoro. There you go. Yes, Dr. Santoro. 
Yep. Hi, everybody. Um, I am part of an osteopathic orthopedic residency that's ACGM accredited. This is the first year I think we're eligible to take the ABOS board examination. Do you guys have any input or insight into whether or not we should take both exams, one exam, which one we should take moving forward, just because it's kind of a unique situation that we haven't really had before? Uh, sure. That's a, a good question. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, obviously I'm partial to the ABOS process, uh, because it's something that, uh, uh, you know, I've lived and breathed for 17 years. Um, uh, but, um, I, I think that, I think it's a matter of personal preference. I really do. Uh, and certainly just, uh, um, you know, if you're finishing an ACGME accredited residency program, uh, we feel like, and your program director signs off, uh, from the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery, we feel like that, uh, uh, allows you the opportunity to enter our board certification process. And we're happy to guide you through that. Uh, at, at the same time, I know the AOBOS, uh, certainly has a reasonable process. And I think that would be a matter of personal preference. Thank you. Let's go with Dr. Lee. Hey, thank you, Dr. Martin, for presenting. I uh, just had a quick question regarding how the formatting of the blocks worked out. It, looked, it seemed like there were seven blocks, but the first six were, you know, 50 some questions. And then the last one was 16. Can you uh, talk to us about why the formatting is such as it is? Uh, that's, uh, uh, the board feels like 328 questions is the right length. That allows us to standardize the exam over a number of years. And the way the testing blocks uh, have been done for numerous years is that way. And so we have stuck with that. Um, I, I don't know that there's any uh, particular science involved in that other than 328 questions uh, divided over that many blocks. Um, I suppose you could divide it evenly, but that's just how it's been for a long period of time. And what we do is anchor the exam year over year. So there are, on the part one examination, we have equator items. Those are questions that have been used numerous times in the past that we know how they perform. And we use those not every, usually it's two years uh, in between the time that they're used but there's a certain number of those on each examination. So that allows us to standardize the results of the examination such that if you take it in 2024 or 2021 or 2027, we set a passing standard and you have the same uh, chance of passing in any one of those years. And so uh, the exam has been that way for a long time. Uh, if we change that, then we'd have to change that standard. And so we've left it that way. So there's not not any magic there, um, but uh, I, I think that's that's another sort of urban legend that I hear. Oh, the the pass rate was high last year, and the board's going to correct that, or the pass rate was low last year, and the board was happy or sad about that, and they're going to correct that. Actually, what we try and do is set a standard. So we um, have stuck with the same standard. Uh, gosh. Uh, 14 years. 14 years. Yeah. yeah, I think 14 years. Um, and basically the scores are, uh, the psychometricians take the score, actually layer them out over a different scale than just one to 328, but it's over a different scale. Use the equator items. And then there's a certain anchor score that we've used for 14 years and we stick with that standard. And then every several years, we have a group of subject matter experts get together and look at each question on the exam and try and decide how hard a question that is and what percentage of people ought to get that right or wrong. And that helps us pick and make sure we're still correct on that passing standard. Uh, the other thing that happens is shortly after the examination, uh, and we just did this for this year, uh, we go through all of the items and several fall out based on their performance, either too many people got it right, too many people got it wrong, the wrong people got it right or wrong, the question didn't distinguish, uh, uh, lots of people got it wrong and everyone put one answer that we didn't feel was the right answer. And so we get another group of individuals together and look at each of those questions 
and decide whether or not they should be scored? Have they been keyed wrong? Is there some issue with the question that we didn't see before it was administered? Um, so that's that's uh, another thing that's called key validation. Uh, and then we decide how many questions ought to be scored. And that's what we did last week. And now uh, in the next week or so, we'll then have another uh, group to get together and look at how those results layer out and how they compare and um, set the passing standard. So people do um, sometimes comment on how a question gets to the examination and uh, why does it cost a thousand dollars? And uh, for a question to get there, it's reviewed by uh, a question writing task force, which is a group of orthopedic surgeons from around the country, uh, a field test task force, which is another group of orthopedic surgeons from around the country, uh, a um, form review group, and then finally the ABOS written examination committee reviews every question. So obviously put, putting together those groups is um, somewhat costly. And then each time those questions are evaluated uh, by our partner. Right now we partner with the American Board of Medical Specialties and their uh, question writers, question editors, and psychometricians to look at all that. Probably more information than you wanted about the nine blocks, but that that's basically how we arrive at the nine blocks. Anyone else with any questions? No. Any panel members? Uh, David, it's on your mic. Anything I forgot? Did you happen to mention the email? The, the email is critical. I, I, you, <laughs> thanks. I know people, people are probably laughing. I, I know people are laughing at us, but I, I promise October 15th and then next July, ninth when somebody says i didn't know i was supposed to schedule and we call them they'll say oh i forgot to update my email but we're trying yeah uh okay i think um again also uh if you know of anybody who missed this presentation it will be posted on our podcast posted on our website for you to listen to or watch again uh, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, we're happy to uh, walk you through the process. And thank you for your attention. And uh, we'll look forward to a good process over the next year. <laughs>